Okay, so we are looking at parameterized algorithms, fixed parameter algorithms or parameterized algorithms, parameterized complexity. And here, uh, typically our input comes with the usual input, a graph, let us say we are talking about graphs, along with some parameter. And our aim is to design an algorithm which is exponential or even worse on the parameter, but it is polynomial on the rest of the input. Okay? And the motivation is that if the parameters are small, the algorithm is still practical. Right? So, this is what I mentioned yesterday about enlarging the notion of feasibility beyond polynomial time. Okay, not just purely polynomial time, but I allow exponential on something, some small parameter and if that parameter is small, it is still a reasonable practical algorithm. Okay? So, our inputs come with um, some graph G and a parameter K, uh, some integer, which whatever is appropriate, we will choose and yesterday we saw two different parameterizations. One was uh, solution size for a number of problems, cluster vertex deletion, vertex cover, deheating set and whole number of problems we saw solution size as a parameter and we designed some FPT algorithms. And I also introduced what if your graph is k away from a forest and we looked at minimum vertex cover algorithms and there the parameter is not a solution size because I was looking for minimum vertex cover but the parameter was the distance to the forest. Okay. So, for most part today and tomorrow we will look at solution size as a parameter, it just makes life simpler to fix things for the ease of exposition. And so, one algorithmic technique we saw yesterday was this notion of branching, right? where somehow we identify some small number of objects, at least one of them must be in any solution and we will try them all. So, the key thing was that the branching factor on the recursion tree was small because this is the small number of objects you are trying to do and the depth of the branching tree was k because or even less sometimes actually because if k drops faster, you will see that it is even less. Okay? So, that is how you design better algorithm. Right? So, in the examples we saw k was dropping by 1, at least 1 is what we could guarantee. But you are going to tell us an algorithm <laughs> uh, for vertex cover where k will drop faster and we will design a, a better algorithm. Right? That was your uh, task. Okay. Good. So, so, that was one algorithmic technique that is the branching algorithm. Today, I am going to talk about a couple of other algorithmic techniques. So, today's first session technique is this notion of kernelization. So, recall again that on the input size, we want things, our algorithm to run in polynomial time, pure polynomial independent of k and square and cubed kind of thing. I do not want k sitting on top of n, but then there is some other either a multiplicative factor or an addictive factor is just a function of k which will typically be exponential or even worse because we are looking at hard problems. So, you do not expect better than exponential anyway. Okay. So, the idea of kernelization is that we want to compress the input, pre-process the input. Okay. So, this is also called pre-processing. In fact, as I mentioned, the whole area of parameterized algorithms is about 20 years now and kernelization and more developments in kernelization is even more recent. So, there are about 4 or 5 books on parameterized algorithms and there is also a one exclusive book on kernelization alone. Okay? Uh, that is pretty recent only last year, you will see you know just Google pre-processing or kernelization and you will see a whole book on kernelization. Okay? Okay, so, what is the idea here? We have some input and a parameter. What we are going to do is that you are allowed only polynomial time, polynomial in n and k. 
okay? No, not even exponential in k, which we have been allowing in fixed parameter algorithms, but you have to do a polynomial time. But we do not want to solve the problem, but we want to somehow reduce the size of the input. Okay? So, we want to get some g prime k prime here and say that okay, now that is the new problem you have to solve, that is a new instance you have to solve. But the key thing is that the size of g prime and k prime are just functions of k. Meaning, so this, this will have some v, let us say there are n vertices and then some e, there are m edges and then there is this parameter k. But what kernelization asks you to do is to allow spend polynomial time and produce an input where the size of g prime, the number of vertices, number of edges all become function of just the parameter. So, in, in particular n and m is no longer in the picture. Okay, so, this is the pre-processing. Somehow, we have removed some vertices, we have deleted some edges or maybe even answered the question we want to solve along the way. But we have not answered. At the end of it, we want a small graph. What, how do we measure this notion of small? The size of the graph is just a function of the parameter. Okay. So, this, this algorithm is called uh, kernelization algorithm and this is called a kernel, kernel is the output. Okay. So, it, you know, think of you know, kernel has an English meaning, right, which just basically gets to the core of something. So, somehow you are throwing away some redundant information, some things and finally, you get to the core and now the beauty of this is now at this point, if I just do any brute force algorithm here, right, I do not have to be very efficient you still have a fixed parameter tractable algorithm, right? Why? right? Recall the notion of fixed parameter tractable. Um, our algorithm running time, we want to be some function of k times some pure polynomial in n, right? So, now what I am saying is what is the use of this kernelization that after you have done this pre-processing and you get to this g prime and here you run your apple in a pretty bad exponential 2 power k power whatever kind of an algorithm. I claim that overall running time is of this type. Why? What is the overall running time? polynomial time plus why is it f of k? Because the size of this input is just a function of k. There is no n, m, nothing here because I have just deleted everything. Now, it is maybe there are k square vertices here and there are you know 2 power k edges or something, k square vertices, k power 4 edges, some such thing. It is only a function of k here. So, now you run your 2 power n algorithm, some brute force algorithm, n for us is only k square or a function of k. So, this overall running time here would simply be a function of k plus a polynomial time. Okay? So, that is the power of this kernelization because if you manage to come up with a, a kernel like this, that gives you another algorithmic technique to show something is fixed parameter tractable. Okay? Everybody remembers what fixed parameter tractable means that you want an algorithm of this type. right? Okay, so now you know what problems are amenable to such a thing, what can you kernelize, that is the whole area of kernelization and we will see uh, one example today again in using the popular vertex cover example and we will uh, give a kernelization algorithm for this. Okay? So, to summarize you have let us say you have a graph G and you are trying to see whether there is a vertex cover of size k. Now, we will spend only some polynomial. So, this is typically when people implement many of these algorithms, you do some standard pre processing. In fact, we already saw a couple of pre processing rules yesterday. I okay? will uh, recall them to start with. 
and then yeah Ah, remove isolated vertices of one pre-processing rule we already saw. What else did you see? If you have a degree one vertex, just go and pick its neighbor into the solution, delete that. So we will come up with more such rules. At the end of it, the new graph will turn out to be a graph of small size, where small here means the function, it's just a function of parameter. N and N will go, M will go away. And then there you can apply any brute force algorithm. So now we will not worry about how do you solve it here because now at this point you can apply your 2 power k algorithm which we saw already but, but not on this compressed input, right? You can do anything you want here, right? So now we will worry about how fast, what are some interesting pre-processing rules we can come up with and reduce the input size. And I am going to use only vertex cover as an example and in the tutorial we will see a couple of other examples. Okay. So, so our input is a graph G and this is always the case whether I say it or not the number of vertices is denoted by N and the number of edges is K is my parameter. And note that here I am not allowed to do n choose k all that because I, the kernelization algorithm should be a polynomial time algorithm. So I will just do some simple pre-processing. And the question is, does there exist a subset of vertices whose size is at most k such that g minus s is edgeless, right? There are many ways of defining vertex cover such that every edge has at least one endpoint in s. So let us recall the rules we already saw. So rule 1, delete isolated vertices. <coughs> rule 2 which I may or may not even use it that if you have a vertex of degree 1 with y as its unique neighbor, include y in the solution and delete y and also k becomes k minus 1 because you have already picked one vertex into the solution, now you are looking for a k minus 1 size solution. The following is a more crucial rule. Suppose you have a vertex whose degree is more than k, okay? What can you say? Why? That should be in the solution, okay? Why? Okay, what is the problem with that? Exactly, right. have you seen this before? No, good, okay. Yes, so if you have a vertex whose degree is strictly more than k, you should include it in the solution we are looking for. See, we are looking for a solution of size at most k, which may or may not exist, I do not know. But I am trying to build a solution of at most k vertices to cover all edges. So here is where we use the fact that we are not looking for minimum vertex cover. I am happy to see if there is a vertex cover of size at most k, right? So if you have a vertex whose degree is more than k, Then if I do not include x into my solution, who is going to cover this edge? I have to pick this neighbor. I have to pick this neighbor and there are more than k of them, but I am trying to build a vertex cover of size at most k. So, you know, include x in solution, again k becomes k minus 1. Now, you can keep applying these rules again and again. Go back now, at this, after you delete x, we also delete x. 
that there may be some isolated vertices which you can delete. There may be some degree one vertices which you can process. So you, after you come here, just go back and apply again and again. And every time you are deleting something, so you won't do this forever. At most, maybe n steps because the graph. If if you don't make any progress, you stop at that point. Okay. So you keep applying these rules. We have these three rules now, isolated vertices, degree 1 and degree more than k. Keep applying these rules. Let's say my resulting graph or the resulting problem I have is some g prime and k would have also come down because there are many places we are dropping k. And now you have a gra graph g prime where I am looking for a k prime sized solution. Okay. What are the properties of g prime? What do we know about g prime, the resulting graph? Size is reduced, we believe so, we don't know because maybe none of the rules are applicable, right? If the rules are applicable, size is reduced, maybe none of the rules are applicable, but no isolated vertices because, you know, we would have deleted. No pendant vertices and maximum degree in the graph is at most k, right? So now, so G prime has no isolated vertices. No degree 1 vertex. So no degree 1 is not going to be a big, important, useful thing for me. Um, and degree is at most k. Sorry? Sir? Hmm. Yeah. Ah, so you're saying not k but k prime. Yeah, okay, good, good observation. So, whatever I mean, I'm going to call that k prime as the k. Okay, so whatever that because our input is z comma k. So, if the k changes, then you look for a vertex of degree greater than that, or you can also look for a degree greater than k. That's also fine, right? Because anyway, it's the same thing. Yeah, you're right that you can actually be even tight and say k prime. But for the analysis and the proof, let's stick to k. It's easier. Okay. So now I want to capture some property of g prime. Okay. That suppose g prime has a k prime sized vertex cover. Then I'll prove a lemma. Okay. Suppose g prime has a k prime sized vertex cover, because that's what we are looking for. Then, number of vertices in G prime is at most you know, k plus one into k prime, and number of edges in G prime is at most k square. So we're going to prove this. Using whatever properties we have now captured, I'm going to argue that if G prime is to have a vertex cover on K prime vertices, then it cannot have too many vertices and not too many edges. Okay. So suppose I may be wrong on these terms. We'll we'll figure out what it is. So suppose it has a vertex cover of size K prime, and this is the remaining graph. What do we know about the vertices, the induced subgraph here? No, 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 wait. No. Suppose k prime is the vertex cover of the resulting graph. No edges at all. In this part, there are no edges at all. So all the edges are going here like this. Or of course, there are edges inside. Okay. There are no isolated vertices. And in G prime, every vertex has degree at most k. Now, I want to bound the number of vertices here. 
how many vertices can you have here in this? Okay. I claim that not too many vertices because there are no isolated vertices. So everybody is adjacent to somebody there, but everybody out there in K prime has degree at most K. So the number of vertices here is at most K times K prime. Is that clear? Shall I repeat? So suppose I have a k prime sized vertex cover and let us say this is the vertex cover. Oh, you can not see it. Okay. So suppose this is the k prime sized vertex cover, then the remaining graph is edgeless. There are no edges here, no isolated vertices here. So, but we also know that every vertex in the whole graph is as degree bounded by k, right. So, a vertex here may have some k neighbors here, another vertex may have at most k neighbors here. So, overall you cannot have more than k prime times k vertices here because otherwise they will be isolated and we have deleted isolated vertices, okay. So, that shows this because that is exactly what I have shown. The number of vertices in this whole graph is not more than k prime plus k prime times k which is k prime times k plus 1, okay. And the number of edges is again, if, I mean all edges are incident here and each vertex has degree at most k. So, it is at most k prime times k which is at most k square, okay. That clear? So, we apply these three simple rules. Now, I have a new graph. What is the size of the graph? Number of vertices, number of edges are all bounded by k square. n has gone away. n and m have gone away, right. I mean just, just understand this. I have suppose I have a graph on some 10 million vertices in which I am looking for a vertex cover of size 50, okay. Is, does this graph have some 50 vertices that cover all edges, then by applying this simple, you know, all these rules can be implemented in linear time. In linear time, we have reduced, ah, okay, uh, there is one more thing I need to do, okay, fine. So, um, actually no, J, G prime may not have only this many vertices, G prime may have lot more vertices, okay. Then what happens from this claim, okay, so I am going to add, so, so, that is the end of the proof of this claim. Now, let me add one more rule, okay. Reduction rule 4. If number of vertices in G prime is more than, you know, k square plus k or number of edges in G prime is more than k square, what should I say? So, I have done these rules, yeah, then there cannot be a vertex cover of size at most k or k prime in G prime because this claim tells you if there is a vertex cover of size at most k prime in G prime, you cannot to have too many vertices and edges. So, now I will go and look at the measure number of vertices and edges in G prime. If it is large, then I, I have answered this problem question is there a vertex cover of size k prime and g prime? I will say, I will say return no. Okay, so that is that is the end of the algorithm. Yeah. This one, right. So, what I argued is the number of vertices here is at most k times k prime. Do you agree with that, right? So, that is, but this is all the whole graph is. So, how many vertices are here? k prime plus k times k prime, that is this, okay. And number of edges, to be more precise, I can say um, k prime times k, yeah. Because all, I mean all edges are incident here, I mean there are edges incident here, but they are also incident there. So, one way to count the edges is to count the edges here, 
incident on these vertices, and when each vertex has degree at most k, so total number of edges is at most k prime times k. Okay. So my rule number four is, after I have done these three rules, I will count the number of vertices, number of edges. If it is too large, I will say no, the answer is no. Otherwise, I have a new graph. I have not solved the problem yet. Otherwise, I have not solved the problem yet, but solving was not my goal anyway. Remember, my goal was to move from G to get a G prime. I want to do in polynomial time to get a G prime K prime, where the sizes of this G prime and K prime are just functions of K. Okay? And that is obtained because they are like K square. Now, on this reduced graph, you can do whatever you want. You can do some brute force algorithms and overall you have separated this function of k and the polynomial nicely that its algorithm is a fixed parameter tractable algorithm. Okay? All right. So, um, it turns out you can do better. Meaning, you can improve the number of vertices to actually, so right now it is like k square. I can even reduce it to order k by some nice properties, graph theoretic properties and more rules and stuff. You can eliminate some vertices, rules and so on. Okay? And the key to thing, the, the rule is this. We want, so, the whole idea of kernelization is to come up with more and more interesting rules to compress the input, to eliminate vertices, to eliminate edges and stuff. So, so, one rule we saw was that if you have a degree 1 vertex, then you can pick its neighbor into the solution. right? Now, we can generalize it in the following way. So, suppose I have a, um, let us say I have this two vertices, which have edges like this. Okay, and suppose this is independent. and then maybe there is more happening in the graph. Then what can, what sort of rule can you come up with? You have to include those two vertices. You might as well, you are better off including those two vertices into the solution and then you get rid of a lot of vertices. Why? Because, I mean, why do I have to include these two vertices? Because these edges need to be covered. I can pick those vertices, but that side is independent anyway. So, they are not playing any big role, so I might as well pick these two vertices. Because there are at least two edges, you need these two vertices, you pick these two vertices and they play a better role. So, you get to eliminate a lot more vertices. Okay? So, this takes us to the notion of what is called a crown. Okay? So, that is a picture, so there is, a, you know, basically what we are going to do is to go into the graph, find more properties find more rules, polynomial time implementable rules, eliminate more things. Okay? So, there is a notion of crown rule. So, the crown is a more formal way of what I just gave you this. It has, okay, I will describe what it is. Okay, and you will see why it is called crown. Yeah. So, let us talk about a crown decomposition of a graph. It is just a partition of the vertex set into three parts. Okay. C, H and B. C is an independent set. So, within C there are no edges. And C's neighbors are only in H, meaning there is a there is no edge between C and B. And the second property is more important property. No, the third property. There is a matching between C and H that covers H. Okay? So, let us just make sure you understand this. What is a crown? It is simply a partition of the vertex set of the graph into three parts, C, H and B. Where C is an independent set, C's neighbors are only here and there is a matching that saturates all vertices of H. Okay, and so B is the rest of the vertices. Okay. So the so the next few minutes I am just going to do pure graph theory. So 
graph theory should get charged and follow this. Okay. So, um, so just like our degree one reduction rule, if I have a crown, then what can you say for vertex cover? I am trying to find a minimum vertex cover. Suppose I manage to find a crown, then what can you say? Hmm? I want some new, new voices. What is the rule? Yep. Okay, old voices are okay. <laughs> but young voice. <laughs> you will have to? H, right? Now, it's not you will have to, but you can. Okay, there is a difference between that. It just says that there is always a minimum vertex cover that contains all of H. Okay? Because the key, key thing is this, this is important. There is a matching that saturates C and H, that covers H. So that means there are H many edges in the matching. So to cover these edges, you need to pick some H vertices. You can pick some from here, some from there. Sure, clearly you can. But you might as well pick all of them from here. Anyway, you need H vertices to cover these matching edges. So this matching property is important. Okay, I want to emphasize that. So because of this matching, there are H disjoint edges. And you need to pick H vertices to cover those disjoint edges. So you can pick some from here and some from here to cover those edges. But you might as well pick from here because it has a lot of advantages. You will cover these edges plus you may cover more things as well and this is an independent set so picking anything from here is not going to play any role. Okay. I mean it might play a role to cover a lot of one vertex may see a lot of edges and cover that but anyway there are so many matching edges you need to pick that many from that matching edges you might as well pick H here. Okay. So all this is a proof of correctness. Okay. So it's, I'm, I've just said all the intuitive thing. But formally, you need to prove that there is always a minimum vertex cover that contains all of H and none of C. Okay? That's the advantage of crown. Okay? Now, if you do that, so if you find a crown, you can take these H vertices, delete them. C also goes away because they become isolated. Keep repeating it and you know it gives you a rule to eliminate lots of several lots of vertices. But we need to formally analyze and say, how would I find a crown? I haven't told you that. Right? How fast can I find a crown? And suppose there is no crown at all, what would be the size of the resulting graph? Okay, so we need to argue that. Questions? Yeah. No. B can have all kinds of edges here. So the picture is confusing, but yes, B is not necessarily an independent set. So we, are, we have not solved the problem by picking H. We pick H, the whole thing goes away. Now your new problem is to go and recurse on this set. That's a very good point. Yeah. So we continue and the problem, just like the degree one rule, we picked its neighbor, deleted, and then recurse on the resulting graph. So similarly, now we will continue and apply and look for all the rules inside this graph. All of this will go away. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so now we have, we know what a crown is. I have to tell you how to find a crown. And if the crown doesn't exist, how large the resulting graph will be. Okay, that will tell you. Because the resulting graph is my kernel. Okay, so this is the, the crown rule. If I find a crown, the matching needs to be covered anyway, and we can assume that it is covered by vertices of H. There is no point in picking vertices of C. So the reduction rule would be from G, I will delete H union C because H goes into the solution. So H is reduced from my budget. H goes into the solution. And once I delete H, C, all vertices of C will become isolated anyway. So you will get, you can delete them. And now you apply recursively on this problem on this graph. Okay, so now, who tells, I mean, when will a crown exist? 
And if the crown doesn't exist, how, how big the graph you will have. So that's what is left to do. So here is again a nice, interesting graph theoretic lemma. I want to say it's just a pure graph theoretic lemma, which tells you that this is the lemma. Okay, I'll let you read and understand it. So what it says is, If you have a graph without isolated vertices and integer k, okay, in polynomial time you can find all this, but the polynomial time is essentially a black box we will assume. We can either find the matching of size k plus 1 or we will find a crown or we will conclude that the graph has at most 3k vertices. So now if I prove this, what kind of a kernel will we get? Okay, so we will prove this, you know, short proof. But if I prove this, let us first take stock of what, what have we achieved for the vertex cover problem. Okay, let us see in each of the cases what can I conclude. If I find a matching of size k plus 1, what can we say? Remember, I am trying to find a vertex cover of size at most k in my graph. If I find a matching of size k plus 1, then there is no vertex cover of size at most k because this matching, every edge needs a separate vertex to be covered. That is more than k of them. So you will say no, right? So in this case, we can return no. In this case, We, we know how to reduce the graph, right? We pick all of H into the solution, delete H union C, recurse. If this does not, if neither of this happens, then I am going to prove you that your resulting graph has only 3k vertices. So, that is a kernel. That is a kernel on 3k vertices. End of the story, right? If you could not find this, if you find this, I will say the input instance is a no instance. If you find this, I know how to eliminate vertices and continue and if I do not find either of this, I will prove that the graph has only 3k vertices and stop and I will show you and I will stop because I have produced you a kernel because our goal was to produce a g prime k prime where the size of g prime is some function of k and earlier we had k square but now I am telling you that it will have only 3k vertices, okay, is that clear? Right, yeah. Huh? I am going to prove this. I have not proved you. I am just saying if I prove this, I will prove all of this. We will prove this. Once I prove this, it follows that we have a kernel of size 3k for vertex cover because in this case, I will stop and say no. In this case, I know how to eliminate vertices and recurse and in this case, I will stop and say here is a graph on 3k vertices. So now all I am left to do is to give a proof of this lemma. So this is a, again, if you omit the polynomial time thing, it is just a pure interesting graph theoretical result which simply says that if you have a graph on large number of vertices, either you will have a matching or a crown. Okay. Okay. So the proof uses one important black box. I thought you might have seen this in the school, but I think you have not, which is this notion of this big theorem, Koenig's theorem, which tells you that in a bipartite graph, the maximum matching and minimum vertex cover sizes are the same. Okay. But before that, let us understand the relation between matching and vertex cover anyway, right? So, so I suppose I have a matching M. S is a vertex cover. Then can you tell me the relation between these two things? Which which will be larger, smaller? Hmm? M is smaller. Right. That for any matching, for any vertex cover, 
the vertex cover size must be at least the size of the matching and why? Because for each matching edge you need a separate vertex to cover, one vertex cannot cover two matching edges. Okay. And do you know an example where these two numbers are not the same? Hmm? Odd cycle, yeah. So, what is the smallest example you can give? <laughs> triangle. Let us take a triangle. What is the maximum matching here? You can get size one edge. One edge is the maximum collection of disjoint edges you can get. But the minimum vertex cover you need at least two vertices, you need exactly two vertices to cover all edges. So, these two numbers are not the same. Okay? There are examples where these two numbers are not the same, but it turns out in bipartite graphs maximum matching. So, odd cycles turn out to be the only bottleneck. In bipartite graphs, maximum matching and minimum vertex cover are the same. And matching is something you can always, you can find in polynomial time, right? I think you would have seen it in, uh, have you seen maximum matching in bipartite graphs in this school? I know you have seen this. Maximum matching in bipartite graphs. Did you see an algorithm for it? I think Narayan Swami did this or uh, no, Aritra did it, Aritra, hmm. blank. Hmm. Network flows, using ST flows, one application of flow is to find maximum matching in bipartite graph. Okay. Now, the proof of this theorem, maximum matching is equal to minimum vertex cover, can actually be converted into an algorithm. So, you can find the maximum matching given a bipartite graph, you can find the maximum matching, apply max flow or there are good algorithms to find maximum matching and then you can do a little bit more work and get a minimum vertex cover as well. So, if you have not seen this, this is a very interesting theorem, you should know, if you find out and also see the algorithm to find a minimum vertex cover. So, the net net what I am saying is even though vertex cover is an NP hard problem in general graphs, it is polynomial time solvable on bipartite graphs using matching ok. And we are going to use this for the proof of this theorem and recall what I am left to do is to give a proof of this lemma right. We will use this thing that in a bipartite graph maximum matching and minimum vertex cover are the same. So, here is this proof of this lemma. First, what I will do is to find a maximal matching, ok. What is the difference between maximal and maximum? In general, maximal maximum is a more general concept in math, right. Maximal means you cannot add any more to this, right. Even though it may not be the maximum sized, but you cannot add any more to it and maximum means that it is the absolute maximum size. So, which is easier to find? Maxi? Maximal is easier to find because you can sort of greedily pick. So, I want to find a maximal matching, I will pick an arbitrary edge and say I am going to add it to the matching it precludes me from picking a lot of edges which have common endpoints with this, throw them away, pick the next edge, add it to the matching, throw the anything which is common. So, keep doing it and you will get a maximal match. It may or may not be maximum and in, in this case I do not even want, to, in fact yeah, I am only want to find a maximal match. Remember the graph given is an arbitrary graph, that is not a bipartite graph, so I cannot, yeah, okay. I mean even in arbitrary graph you can find maximum matching in polynomial time, but that is a different story anyway, ok. Ok, so find greedily a maximal matching. If its size is at least k plus 1, I produced you a matching of size k plus 1, I can stop. Then we are done. 
and the rest of the graph we know is an independent set because it's a maximal matching. If there is an edge here, I would have added it to the matching. Okay, so that's an independent set. So let's remember the set X, which contains these matching edges, and I is the independent set. And I've just find greedily, so it's a fast algorithm for it. Now what I'm doing is, is that ignore the edges inside X. X has a matching, there are lots of edges. Ignore them. I is independent. Look at only this bipartite graph. Consider X as an independent set. I is anyway independent. And look at this bipartite graph and find the maximum matching here using the bipartite matching algorithm. Okay? It will also give you a minimum vertex cover between X and I. That's step two. Okay? So far, I've just done some couple of matching steps. Again, if this matching is of size k plus 1, you can stop and we are done, right? I will produce you a matching of size k plus 1. Now, otherwise, I am going to argue that I will either give you a crown or I will show you that there are only at most 3k vertices, right? I have to show. So, at this point, if I didn't find a matching of size k plus 1, I will prove that one of this happens, okay? So, there are two cases. Case 1, the minimum vertex cover in this bipartite graph, suppose it contains some vertices from x, okay? Suppose it contains some vertices from x. I will produce you a crown. What is a crown? The crown is, remember the three properties of a crown. You have a head, you have a crown which is independent set, there is a matching that saturates h and c only sees h, okay? These are the three properties. So here is my crown. I look at all vertices in the vertex cover this side and that's my head, okay? And its matching partners are C and the remaining vertices form B. And I claim that that is a crown, okay? We need to prove all the three properties. We will prove them one by one slowly, okay? So case one, if your minimum vertex cover in this bipartite graph contains vertices from here, I will produce your crown. Collect all the vertex cover vertices here. That's my H. Their matching partners are C, and I claim the rest of the vertices is the remaining vertices. So what are the three properties to show that it's crown? That C is independent. Is that true here? Because I was independent, and I'm picking my matching partners from I, I was independent, so C is independent. That's good. And there is a matching that saturates H between H and C. Yes, because I actually picked the matching partners. There is a matching that saturates H. Now, the third property is that C doesn't see anybody else outside, right? Because the picture of the crown was Yes, this is the picture of the crown, right? There is C, H, B, and the C should not see anything in B. How do I show that? Okay. Um, it's not clear. Oops. Yeah, so I want to show that C does not see anybody outside the H. So what, what happens if there is an edge like this in the graph? Why not? Right? If there, if there is an edge like this, then it violates the fact that it is a crown. But I claim that you cannot have such an edge. Why not? So what is the property of this H we picked? These are the vertex cover vertices, right? The minimum vertex cover of this bipartite graph picked. So these are the vertex cover vertices, and we picked their matching partners. Remember, in a bipartite graph, maximum matching and minimum vertex cover are the same, means that in every matching edge, exactly one vertex is picked into the vertex cover. So 
So this is not in the vertex cover at all. Okay? And these vertices are not in the vertex cover. Why? Because I would have picked it into H otherwise, because H is exactly the set of vertices from here which are in the vertex cover. So these vertices are not in the vertex cover. These vertices are not in the vertex cover because in any matching edge exactly one vertex is picked. So if I have an edge like this, who is covering that? Right? This is not in the vertex cover, this is not in the vertex cover which is a contradiction. Okay, so you cannot have that kind of edges that satisfies the third condition and hence what I have is a crown. Okay? This is in case if the minimum vertex cover contains vertices from here. The other case, suppose the minimum vertex cover of this bipartite graph contains vertices only from here and I claim that there cannot be more than k vertices here. Remember this matching size is at most k. Right? Because if it is k plus 1 or more, we would have stopped and said no. So this matching size is at most k. And my minimum vertex cover has picked vertices exactly only from here. Right? I mean, is it possible that there are some more vertices here which are not in the vertex cover? Why not? There are no isolated vertices. This is where we use the fact that there are no isolated vertices. But maybe they have edge like this. Exactly. Then the vertex cover, who is going to, who is covering that edge? Because you, you know, it, exactly the matching edges, this is not part of the matching. And if I have something, then this guy would have been, must have been picked in the vertex cover. We assume that everything is coming from here. So, it contains every vertex of i and so there are at most k vertices and here we know there are at most exactly 2k vertices so totally there are at most 3k vertices and that is the third condition. Okay. So let me go over the proof again, right? the whole algorithm. What did we do? First in the graph we greedily find maximum maximal matching and we call the matching edges and the endpoints as x and the remaining vertices is independent. Then we looked at the bipartite graph considering between x and i, we found a maximum matching. Because of Koenig's theorem, you also get a minimum vertex cover in that. And then we had a case analysis based on if the minimum vertex cover contains some vertices of x, then we got a crown. If it did not contain any vertices of x, then we argued that the number of vertices is at most 3k. Okay? So this crown lemma is independently useful to, to eliminate vertices. You know, sometimes you, depending on the problem you have, I have one problem in the problem sheet where you can use this crown lemma to prove some, prob some um, kernel for a coloring problem. Okay, so what have we achieved? We have a 3K sized kernel for vertex cover. Can you summarize the kernel? What do we do? So I give you a graph, G and, and K vertices. What do I do? Delete isolated vertices. Neighbors of pendant vertices. Apply this lemma. Apply this lemma on the reduced graph. If you find a matching of size k plus 1, you say no. If you find a crown, delete h, delete c, recurs on the remaining graph. Continue, right? That's another rule. And if you neither found any, I mean, if you keep applying this, eventually when you stop, your graph will have at most 3k vertices, or along the way, you would have said a no answer to the question. You would have solved the problem. Okay? So kernelization is all about 
you don't necessarily need to solve the problem. But so imagine again going back to my million vertices where I'm trying to find the vertex cover of size 50. In polynomial time, we have reduced the number of vertices to 150 from million vertices. Either you might say, no, there is no vertex cover or you would have pre-processed and got, you know, in polynomial time, you've gotten to a graph on some 150 vertices where you can apply some brute force algorithms and, and solve the problem, okay? So, pre-processing was something which practitioners were all the time doing it, but there was no formal way of measuring and capturing it and this provides a nice way of, you know, formally analyzing the kernel sizes and stuff. Actually, it turns out you can even improve this further. Um, yeah. How that 2K comes? How that 2K comes? Okay. Um, so, in the first step, I find a maximal matching. This X is a maximal matching. If it is of K plus 1 or more, I would have stopped. So, this is at most K. So, how many vertices are there in X? 2K because the matching size is at most k, the number of vertices is at most 2k. Okay. Any other questions? So, have you seen um, linear programming to approximate vertex cover? Yes? Okay. So, let me go through that. That gives you another kernel. So, Let's um, take stock of where we are, right? So we wanted to solve vertex cover using the high degree rule alone, okay? One, two, three, one degree zero, degree one. If a vertex is degree more than K included and, you know, that alone gave us a G prime of size order K square, right? This is high degree rule, let me see. And crown rule gave us a G prime K prime, where G prime is of size at most 3K vertices. Now, I'll walk you through the linear programming formulation of vertex cover you've already seen in the context of approximation, and we will see that you can actually get a 2K sized kernel for that, for vertex cover, okay? Again, I have to use some black box. I won't be able to show everything there, but still it's useful because you've already seen the linear programming formulation. So, can you tell me a linear programming formulation of vertex cover? So your input is some G, V, there is no K for now. And I want to solve vertex cover. Formulate it as an integer linear program. So we want a minimum vertex cover, right? So what are the variables in the linear program? There is a variable for every vertex. And what is the objective function? Minimize summation xv, v in v. Subject to what are the constraints? For every edge? Equal to 1, yes. So for every edge, x u plus x v is greater than or equal to n for all u v in h. And what are the constraints on x variables? Hmm? Greater than equal to 0. This is a linear programming formulation. But if I want to formulate it exactly, then I will have an integer linear programming constraint. So it will be x u is either 0 or 1. Now, what do we know about integer programming? How fast can we solve, you know? NP complete. Why? Yeah, here is the reduction. Right? We have actually given, if I replace this and say x u is in 0, 1, 
what we have done is actually in polynomial time reduced vertex cover to integer programming. So, we have actually proved integer linear programming is NP complete, okay, NP hard. You need to prove it is an NP. Okay. So, integer programming is hard and that is why you relax to linear program and solve the linear program. And there are a couple of theorems we I will just mention, maybe you have seen this that there exists a 0 half 1 optimum solution for this LP. Okay, this is um, um, what is used to give a two approximation algorithm, right? Two approximation algorithm is take all the halves and round them up to one and uh, we can argue that that is at most two times the optimum, right? There is another useful theorem. Again, these are all provable in an hour or so, you know, in a course lecture, but I am not going to do. There exists an integer solution Maybe you can. Huh, actually, let me prove it. Now that you've seen crown, okay, that contains all of one values and none of zero values. Okay. So what I'm saying is, you take solve the LP, you get some with 0, some with half, some with 1. And let us say I really want to find the minimum vertex cover, okay? no approximation. I really want to find the minimum vertex cover. Then what this theorem tells you, in fact you will see an interesting proof quickly, that whatever the LP has set values to 1, you can take them into a solution. There is always a minimum vertex cover that contains all of these 1s. And whatever it has put zeros, you can throw them away and they work with the remaining halves. Okay? That is what this theorem tells you. It requires a proof. And here is a way of seeing the proof, but let us. Okay, so, suppose I say C equal to all vertices for which x v is 0. I partition my vertex set into these three parts, right? LP has put 0, half 1, all those which have got 0, all those which have got 1, all those which have got half, I am going to partition them into vertex, three parts, okay? And I gave the names purposely as CHB because I claim that this forms a crown. Let us see what is easy to see. Um, the matching saturating requires some work, but maybe I can prove that. Okay. So, what are the three properties of the crown? C has to be independent. Is C independent here? Yes, because if I have an edge between two variables which got 0, how can that be an edge? Because you know that the sum has to be at least 1. So, C is independent. Great. C does not see any vertex of B. Why? Because if they see, you look at that edge, this is 0, that is half, but that is not possible, that has to be at least 1. So, C does not see anything of B. Okay? The third property is that there is a matching that saturates H between C and H. Okay? So, I will leave that as an exercise maybe. Um, so, need to prove, okay, so the claim is the CH B form a crown. To prove, essentially we need to show there is a matching saturating vertices of H between C and H. When there are, we need to prove the other two properties, but they are easy to see. But this is a 
more involved property. You need to just check that. Okay. Um, okay, let me try and prove this here. Um, so here is my C and here is an H and I want to show that in this graph there is a matching that saturates H. Okay. And what is the famous theorem to show matching in bipartite graphs? Hmm? Hall's theorem. Again, I do not know whether you saw it in the school, it should have been looked at. Hall's theorem and what is Hall's theorem? If you have a bipartite graph and I want, let us say I want matching that saturates this, then Hall's theorem tells you that for every subset here, the number of neighbors must be at least the size of this subset. Okay? So, I will prove that, we will prove for every subset of H, neighborhood of S intersection C is greater than or equal to kernel to S. Right? For every subset of H, if you look at its neighbors, because there are more things below also, right? Yeah. There is also, but I am just talking about the neighborhood of H in C, their neighbors is at least S. If I show that, then it shows that there is a matching that is saturating H, right? Okay, so, I will give you a hint on how to show it, but I will leave that as an exercise. So, what you do is, suppose you, you have this set S and suppose its neighborhood is smaller, then you can adjust the values. You know, these guys all have values 0, maybe increase it to half and drop these guys to 0. And you can argue that you will actually contradict the fact that what you have is a, an LP optimum solution. Right? There is some adjustment on the XV values you can do, not necessarily half one, I am just, yeah. You can adjust the XV values, yes, these guys all have value one. Suppose I drop them by, drop them to half and increase these guys, the neighbors to half, okay. You can show that whatever you are increasing is a smaller quantity than what you are decreasing because we assume that the neighborhood is smaller, okay. You should look at the picture to understand what I am saying. Okay? So, I want to show this. The neighborhood of this set S here is larger than this. That will show that the matching is saturating H. Suppose it is smaller. One way to prove, get a contradiction is to say, suppose I drop all these values. I drop all these guys by half. They are currently 1. I am going to change them to half. And these guys are currently 0. I will change them to half. Is it? Right? Then I have increased by a smaller quantity, decreased by a larger quantity. So overall there will be a drop. Okay? And then you also have to show that your feasibility is still satisfied. There is no problem. So you can argue that it still is a feasible solution, but the overall LP value has dropped, which is a contradiction. And hence every neighborhood should have a larger quantity and there is a matching that saturates this. This whole thing is a crown. So what now? So if it is a crown, then we know a crown reduction rule tells you that I can get rid of all of these vertices, right? Take all of H into my solution, delete H, the C will also go away and what is left is the vertices in B. And how many vertices are in B? It is actually a one shot reduction. Okay. So, so LP opt is some summation X V star. Right? We solved the LP. And remember now I am looking for a vertex cover of size at most k. Right? That is my goal because I am talking about the parameterized problem now. So, suppose the LP opt value is strictly more than k, what can you say? Not possible. Right? There is no vertex cover of size at most k because LP has relaxed things from integrality to 0 half, you know, I can make any number. And even with this relaxed thing, 
the LP optimum is bigger, the integral optimum is actually going to be even bigger. Is that clear? The minimum vertex cover size is greater than or equal to LP opt. Is this clear? Why? Because you take the minimum vertex cover, that is also a feasible solution to the LP. That is an integral feasible solution to the LP. Right? So, that cannot be smaller because that also satisfies all the constraints of the LP. And so, you might as well give you a better. So, that will be bigger or more. So, if the LP opt is more than K, then return no for my vertex cover problem because the integral solution is going to be even larger than that. So, there is no K sized vertex cover, right. So, at this point, what do I have? I have LP opt is less than or equal to K, okay. So, now I solve LP, check the optimum solution. If it is more than K, I say no. If it is less than K, I look at those values which got 0, half, 1 and I get a crown, do the crown reduction and what I am left with is only this B vertices. Now, what can you say about the size of B? How many vertices can there be? Hmm? LP opt is at most K. So, how many vertices can there be in B? Because what is LP opt? It is the sum of all of these guys. XB quantities is LP opt. You add all the XV quantities and what you get is LP opt, which I tell you is at most K. So, how many vertices can there be in B? 2K. You got a 2K kernel now. That is it. Right? Because, because what is left is only B. I argued that this is a crown. So, you can get rid of H, you can get rid of C. And what is left is whatever the LP has put half. And I have to, now you have to go into that graph and recurse and check, but, but, but the number of vertices in B is at most 2 K. Which implies cardinality of B is at most 2 K and we have Okay, so I mean, let's let's recall where we started off with. We said, "Ha, here is a graph on n vertices k, and I'm looking for a vertex cover of size k. Can you do some pre-processing and reduce the size of the graph? Right? That is the goal in kernelization. And then we will worry about solving whether there is a vertex cover of size k, which, because the graph size is small, we can do some brute force thing there. Okay, so we started with some simple rules." And we use the degree k more than k rule to get a graph on k square vertices. Okay. Then we used crown, crown rule to get a graph on 3k vertices, but then we observe that actually LP solution gives you another way to find another crown using which you can get a 2k sized kernel. Okay. So or currently this is more or less the best kernel for vertex cover. So what is the best kernel is a race here and you know people keep working on it. But more than the actual end result, I want you to just sort of appreciate some of the intermediate things we saw, right? The crown lemma, which is just a, a pure interesting combinatorial graph theoretical lemma, which has many applications. You will see one in the problem sheet today. And you know how you can use LP to get kernels. And um, I think I will stop here.